Thanks again for your interest uh, in being here and apologies for, you know, the very late organization. Uh, I should have done this earlier. Um, so I, mean, I hope everything went smoothly and that when you have to follow sessions remotely, you know, it's going to be fine too. Okay, so yesterday, you know, it was the, the last week, it was a lecture about you know, the introduction telling you that we are going to do geometry. And today, we are not going to do fancy geometry, okay? Today is like the lecture about baselines, about what you can do on flat vector spaces, Euclidean spaces, basically an, as an extension of what you know already about uh, computing distances, applying thresholds, etc. So it's going to be used as a foundation for everything we do uh, later on. And so I'm going to present many methods, uh, try to take a bit of a higher view to, to tell you, okay, how they, in, in which aspects they look alike, in which aspects they are different, and mostly tell you about the limitations that you can understand as limitations about flat vector spaces. And this is what's going to motivate the next few lectures about graphs, about manifolds, this kind of thing. So I assume that you remember this slide uh, from lecture one. Uh, you know, when we say, okay, what is a data set? And as you remember, we said that a data set, essentially it's an Excel, it's an Excel spreadsheet uh, where you have N rows because you have N different subjects and you have D columns that correspond to D features, to D variables, uh, to D quantitative things that you know about those N subjects. And as a general rule, I mean, most of machine learning is concerned about supervised learning, and so which is essentially regression and classification. But classification, as we see, you can understand it just as a subset of regression. And so generally, I mean, the, the main machine learning problem is just to look for a formula, F, of the G variables that you can, that you can apply row-wise uh, row on, on each row, and that allows you to best approximate and then predict an important quantity. So we are talking about uh, heart rate and uh, these kind of things. So uh, we yeah. have, so I mean, in real life, as a, as a data scientist, as a scientist uh, generally, you'll be given such a data set, so a big table, and you have to decide what you're going to do. Okay, and so maybe I can ask you, what is the first thing that you should do uh, when you're given such a data set? You know, a doctor comes, tells you, hey, this is an important problem, please study it. Uh, I don't know what immediately comes to mind. Okay, so no, it's it's a it's a tricky question. The answer is uh, you should take a coffee, uh, take a cake with the people who gave you this data, and I really mean it. Okay, uh, and why? That's because you know uh, data science. It's never done in a vacuum. You need to understand what you're doing, and. <laughs> to understand the real context, not just the context that the doctors believe is, believe is important for you, but in order for you as a data scientist to understand what is really important to them, you need to make it a bit personal. Okay, so that's why I, I wrote that generally working with clients is much less effective than working with colleagues. Mm -hmm. And ideally, you'd want to work with friends. Okay, so because all those coffee breaks, uh, all those cakes that, you know, the, that you eat with doctors or, or I mean, uh, domain experts uh, in any field, uh, you work, this is where you're going to understand that maybe initially they arrived with you with a table and with, mm -hmm. and they formulated a question that they believe was suited to your expertise. But then you realize that, no, no, actually we have to change the question. Uh, mm -hmm. okay. And if you make it too professional, uh, you're never going to come to, to come up to this understanding. So maybe I can tell you, try to get out of the matrix, even though as mathematicians, as engineers, uh, we've been trained to analyze this type of numerical data. And that's because those bricks, those big spreadsheets uh, that we're working with, even if they weigh uh, terab terabytes, they are just partial projections, you know, of a very complex reality. Mm -hmm. In real life, you, you need to understand what people are genuinely trying to achieve, what type of information is available, and what you already know, okay? instead of having tunnel vision. And so to understand this context, you must break the ice with those domain experts. 
And I insist on the fact that this is not just something you do at the start of a project or once every year. You have to do it continuously. It's very time consuming. You know, personally, I spend at least a day a week just doing that, just having chats with doctors. Uh, but first, it's extremely important not to waste your time on fake questions. And second, it can become very enjoyable. Personally, maybe that's what I prefer in my job, actually, to, to, to have discussion not just with my computer or not just with archive papers or not just with computer scientists and mathematicians, but have discussions with real doctors uh, or uh, technicians, these kind of things. I think this is what science is really about, you know, like, not just being a geek. So today, uh, essentially, we're going to focus on the method that that, uh, that works if you hide high quality features. So well-rounded methods uh, for high quality data. So essentially that's, those are the baselines that were developed maybe 30 years ago. And that do the job if you're lucky enough uh, to have access to a, to a great table and to great scientists, to great doctors that can explain to you uh, what they want and that can isolate uh, the most useful features in this table. So, I mean, just as a spoiler about what's going to come, uh, first, we're going to talk about decision trees. Okay, I know, maybe I'm curious to know if you could raise your hand. You've already heard the word and have an idea of how this works. Okay, okay, okay. So that's good because, you know, me personally, I, I did my study mostly in a math department. I had no idea about what decision trees were uh, before my PhD. Okay, like I didn't take any class about that at the MBA. I don't know if there are classes about decision trees in the MBA. Maybe Nicola Vallatis talks about it. I don't know. Uh, but, you know, it's a shame because, I mean, it's ubiquitous in the real world, maybe in business world, especially for heterogeneous data. Like, it's extremely useful if you want to compare features uh, that have a different type. You know, if you have categorical uh, variables, uh, scalar variables, these kind of things. We're going to see that essentially trees are very easy to train using a greedy algorithm and that you have some of the shelf regularization that uh, allow you to mitigate some of the main weaknesses. Then, okay, we're going to say, okay, trees are fine, but you know, it's fine for heterogeneous data. You have a kind of bias along the axis of the feature space, which is a good feature in, in many settings, but for what we're going to do, like 3D geometry, image processing, signal, uh, audio signal analysis, it's really a bad prior, or it's not a great prior. And so we want to work on isotropic methods, methods that have more invariance to rotations of the feature space. And the most simple isotropic method is the k-nearest neighbors. So this, I assume that you have an idea what this means, okay? Uh, so we're going to talk about Euclidean metrics uh, and the normalization that you need to apply if you want to get uh, reliable results. Then we're going to talk about linear regression, which is the most important baseline machine learning model, okay, that allows you to estimate global trends. We're going to talk about uh, the main ways you can uh, try to extend uh, linear regression, first with piecewise linear regression, which is neural networks, and then with polynomial regression. Okay, we'll see that both methods have big downsides. And so uh, finally, you know, in the last 30 minutes, we're going to talk about kernel yes. methods that allow you to specify a Christmas prior while having access to very reliable solvers. Okay, so we're going to talk about smoothness, these kind of things. Maybe I'm just curious, like how many of you follow the class about kernel methods? To know if there is a lot of overlap. It's in, it's in semester two, I think. Really. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I thought it was semester one. So, yeah, so then it's going to be a very short introduction to, to this lecture in the second semester. So that's the program. And so let's start with decision trees. Okay, why decision trees? Well, I mean, you raise your hand so you know already what it is. Well, the motivation is just that expert knowledge is very often presented uh, distilled as a tree. Okay, so those are images that come from a paper about uh, national breast cancer guidelines uh, in the Netherlands, I think. And you see you have those kind of uh, flow charts that are ubiquitous in medicine or in business, where you say, for instance, um, okay, like I see a tumor, I look at the margin, and then I have to make a decision about uh, the about the grading uh, of this uh, of this tumor according to a standard scale, and then I apply a threshold. Okay, maybe 
if it's very small, I say, okay, you're good. Uh, uh, I mean, you're, you're cured. Maybe uh, if the tumor is still there, you have to apply uh, a more precise threshold. You have to measure things in millimeters, then apply a second threshold. And, you know, depending on the gravity uh, of this, mm -hmm. uh, take a decision. So here, you know, we're only uh, working on a tumor, but obviously you can apply those kind of iterative splits uh, uh, of the data uh, using different types of data at, at every node, okay? So you can think of trees as recursive thresholdings, and the good news is that it's extremely easy to train uh, on a computer. Um, you know, even though it's, you're not going to train it using gradient descent, you have access to very easy, uh, greedy methods to do that. So this is what I illustrate here. So let's consider a, a toy data set where you have just a single input feature, X, and, a, and, you, and you try to predict the scalar output. So here I have five data points. So X1, Y1, X2, Y2, X5, Y5. And I want to just find a good decision rule. So here intuitively, you know, try to capture uh, this kind of uh, bowl-like shape. So you say, okay, this is my data set. Maybe a tree with just one leaf is a, is a decision rule that has a constant value. Um, and so it, let's just take the average the value of the yi's. This is a, a tree of depth of one. And then you think, okay, I want to refine this. How do you find a good split uh, to, I mean, where do you put the threshold? Well, mm -hmm. uh, the most naive method, which is what we actually do, uh, is to consider all possible splits uh, of this data. So, at, for instance, what if we decided to put a split at this value of x okay, that's, that separates on one side the smallest value of x and on the other side the, the, the rightmost four values? Then, okay, if I, had, if I know that I'm going to take this split, mm -hmm. I can take the average in, 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 the, in the two uh, subsets and I know that this is going to give the optimal uh, leaf value. So I know that to this split corresponds this regression function. And for this regression function, I can compute a least squares uh, error. So my least square error, obviously, on, the, on this node is going to be zero because this data point is alone in its subset. But on, on, in the other one, uh, I have four different data points. Uh, the average value, you know, it's not so great because here, you undershoot and here you overshoot. So maybe you say, I'm going to consider another split. Uh, so, and this one, you know, it looks nice, okay? Uh, because for, for the first two nodes, uh, you have relatively small error. And on the other three nodes, it's still manageable. But then just in case you look uh, at the two other splits and then you make a decision. Okay, the decision you're going to make is first out of those four splits, you're going to pick uh, the one with the smallest uh, regression error. Here, it's this one. And then you're going to say, okay, do I want to add this split in my model? And this is not clear because obviously you, there is a trade-off between accuracy and uh, smoothness or simplicity of the model. You know, it's Occam's razor. Uh, Occam's razor. Uh, obviously, if, if we decide to always split the data, we're just going to end up with a model that overfits on uh, every single data value. So here, the simple decision rule is to look at the, at the increment in performance between having one leaf and having those two leaves. Then I look at this delta uh, in terms of uh, least square error, and I say, okay, if this delta is larger than a given threshold, I decide to split. If it's smaller than a given threshold, I stay where I am. And this method, as I'm sure you can, you can tell, you can apply it recursively because now you just have two different subsets where you can once again apply the split, uh, try, try to with split, etc. Okay, and this is just how it works. Okay, uh, this is how decision trees uh, are are fitted, and you can understand this recursive algorithm as a greedy minimization a very simple uh, loss function that combines a data attachment term, so the fit, uh, the fitness of F, which is a least score error on my training data set, 
plus, and this plus indicates that you want to compromise between two things, plus a regularization term. And here the regularization term is just so this factor T times the number of leaves in the, uh, in the tree. Okay, and this is a very common form that we're going to see where you have a fixed data attachment term plus a regularization term that is uh, proportional to a given constant. And this constant, so this parameter value, that we often call the regularization parameter, is, is going to be an ubiquitous parameter. I mean, in, in all the toolbox that you're going to use for any regression method, you're more or less always going to have something which is equivalent to this t. And the idea is always that if t is small, it means that you don't really care about regularization, so you are prone to overfitting. Whereas if t is very large, then you put, uh, I mean, adding leaves costs a lot of money, adding complexity costs a lot of money, and so you're going to stick to very simple trees. So that's for simple decision trees, and I mean, throughout the, the class, okay, okay, this was a very simple model. Uh, throughout the class, we're going to illustrate those models on two toy data sets. One, uh, the first toy data set is one-dimensional. So I have n points x on the unit interval, 0, 1, and I want to predict a scalar value. The second data set is going to be two-dimensional, and this is to allow you to see at least how things work in a multi-dimensional space. So it's never going to be very high-dimensional, but spoiler alert for the next lecture, none of the methods that I'm going to show you today is really suited to very high-dimensional data. So 2D, I mean, it's a good illustration. It gives you the intuition. And here, so we have 20 points, uh, X on the unit square, uh, 0, 1 times 0, 1. Uh, and so here I have very positive value in red uh, and uh, very negative values in blue. And here in between, something around the zero. So in both case, in both cases, I want to find a good predictor. And so what we've seen is that a tree of depth zero is just one constant value, so it's just an average predictor. So it's very uh, underwhelming, uh, but you can represent it this way. You know, so I'm always going to represent uh, the decision rule in the one-dimensional case as a blue line. Uh, those cyan uh, error bars uh, is the thing that we want to minimize with a trade-off uh, that depends on the model complexity, and on the right-hand side. Uh, I'm essentially, I'm, I'm showing you using uh, co uh, color values um, the value of my model on all the points of the 2D plane. So this is depth zero, and now this is depth one. So what you see is that with a tree, uh, with a binary tree of depth one, we have access to two distinct values, and our model is piecewise constant. So, I mean, in the 1D case, we've already... Uh, seen how the algorithm worked, and okay, it, it shows uh, this split. Okay, I just use scikit-learn to generate the data. So okay, this is a this is uh, this seems to be a sensible choice. And uh, on the on the rightmost images, on the rightmost image, uh, you know how many splits uh, were considered? Well, we have twenty data points, but we have two features. So here, you know, when you have 20 data points in dimension one, you have to consider 19 splits. In dimension two, if you're very greedy, you consider 19 splits along dimension one and 19 splits along dimension two. And so it's 38 splits. Okay, so you see it kind of grows quickly, uh, but it's still very cheap. Uh, so if you have less than 10,000 points, you do it greedily. And beyond that, what people actually do is uh, you put your data set into uh, bins. So you, you apply binning, you apply histograms, and then you just uh, consider splits uh, along those bins. And in, in practice, it's more than good enough. So here, uh, this is what was found. But now, obviously, what's interesting is what happens when, you, when we go deeper. Well, with depth two here, you know, I have decided to split my two previous cells uh, and every time I have access to at most two values, so one or two values, depending on uh, whether or not the increment uh, uh, is worth uh, is worth the effort. So I think in dimension one, you know, it behaves exactly as you would expect. But uh, the, the, but the but the interesting uh, picture is uh, on the right hand side. What you've seen is that uh, the model chose to split the red cell horizontally. 
the left cell horizontally and the right cell vertically. Most interestingly, you see that. Uh, yeah. Most interestingly, you see that the the type of decision rule that is favored by decision trees uh, is heavily biased along the axis, and this is going to be the main sticking point about trees: is that since they work iteratively uh, by applying um, uh, by applying threshold along the axis. Uh, they give you a combination of vertical and horizontal cuts. So that's for depth two. Then depth three, you know, you can go deeper. But here you see that quickly it stops uh, being worth the effort, at least with a high value of T. So here clearly I only used one, two, three, four, five, six different values. So it appears that the algorithm uh, chose to stop in two for, uh, for the split of two of the eight leaves. So that's fine. It's a way of limiting complexity. In the two-dimensional case, uh, I mean, regularization did not play a part, but okay, this is always going to look like a, a bit like a, a modern painting. But then you say, okay, this is for depth three. Now depth four, you have access to 16 distinct values and you start to clearly overfit. So especially on the 2D case, Depths four, depths five, thirty-two distinct values. Depths ten, up to a thousand distinct values. And here you see that okay, I have decreased uh, the parameter t. You get full of a fit on both data sets. So maybe what is striking in this example is how quickly we switched uh, from something that made sense, you know, depths two, and immediately we overfitted. Okay, and that's because. The, the number of possible values is exponential uh, uh, with respect to the depth. So it's two at the power uh, the depth. And we have zero mechanism in place here to enforce some kind of smoothness you know, between two distinct values. I mean, since it's greedy, it's completely parallel. Uh, the, the decision tree algorithm doesn't try to harmonize uh, the value, so it, it, it enables very sharp switches here from this value to this one, etc. So, yeah, this is uh, all the important remarks uh, on this on this picture. You know, so I'm going quite slowly here because I want to be sure uh, that you all understand what is displayed on those figures. Because after afterwards, we're going to 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 illustrate more complex models. It's uh, I know that the, the first time you see a picture, uh, it's, it's, it's always hard to understand what is happening. So, but, you know, if we have to recap about decision trees and their strengths and weaknesses, well, the first selling point of decision trees is, is that they are extremely interpretable. They, out of the box, they come in the form which is easy to understand by humans and which is already uh, adopted in many fields. Okay, so, I mean, this is an incredible uh, selling point. Even all the methods, even linear regression uh, is more worrying uh, for people. So, I mean, I'm not even talking about kernel methods and neural networks. So uh, that's why it's in red. Uh, second, it's super easy to train and deploy. Uh, I mean, software for this kind of task has been around since at least uh, the early 90s. Uh, it's fast and it's very CPU friendly. Like you, you don't need a big GPU to train this kind of model. So this is all the quality of life, uh, this is about quality of life uh, features, and those are very important. But then, from a, even from a mathematical perspective, uh, decision trees have several very strong selling points uh, most, that, are, that mostly have to do with robustness. Okay. The first thing is that with a, with a tree of depth D, you use at most D columns at a time for your mm -hmm. decision. So, you have out of the box a very strong uh, sparsity, uh, very strong uh, sparsity prior. And as you're going to see in other MBA case, classes, many, many different fields, sparsity is, uh, I mean, is a desirable property both for interpretability and uh, for robustness, uh, noise, cursor dimensionality, etc. Second aspect is that out of the box, it works well uh, with heterogeneous features. Like you don't need to have comparable units or just comparable data types between your different columns. And this is not a property 
which is common you know, in the machine learning world. I mean, everything you've learned about like convolutional neural networks, they take as input a grid of pixels. Uh, and so you assume that essentially all of your columns have the same nature. They're all pixel values. And as soon as you try, you know, to merge video and text, oh, you know, it, it becomes complex. Mm -hmm. um, so I mean, uh, this is a massive problem. And so uh, decision trees just allow people to work with extra spreadsheets that they have somewhere on their computers and, and they just work. Okay, so this is, uh, I mean, this is an extremely desirable uh, feature that we tend to forget about when we do math. And finally, maybe uh, the most underrated feature uh, when you're doing uh, the PhD is that because decision trees only rely on comparisons, you know, they don't rely on plus, they don't rely on time, they don't rely on arithmetic operations. They just rely on making comparisons. They only rely on the ordering of the features. And so it means that basically you take your column, the only thing that matters is who is bigger, who is smaller. You don't care about the units about the column. You don't care if the scores uh, are real valued scores or if they are normalized to take values between zero and one. No, no, we don't. And none of this matters. And so, I mean, it's, I mean, it's also a huge uh, quality of life improvement uh, and a massive, uh, a massive uh, factor, you know, in their popularity. Because, I mean, as engineers, uh, as, uh, as doc, as PhD students, soon you're going to develop models and and probably it's going to work on your machine. You know, with your data, you're going to have tuned the hyperparameters. Uh, you're going to be happy with the result. But the real test comes when you send uh, the model to someone who has similar data, or even better, when someone that you don't know about downloads your code and tries to apply it on, its, on his or her own, own data. And there, uh, being confident that your model won't be completely uh, thrown into disarray uh, by a bad normalization about the features, I mean, it makes or breaks the difference because obviously in real life what happens is that people hear about your work or hear about the keywords about your work. They go on Google, they say, oh, nice, there's a GitHub or even better, there's a pip. They, they do pip install your code. They try it on their data. If it doesn't install, okay, bye-bye. Uh, and uh, if it doesn't work more or less on their data in five minutes, it's yeah. also bye-bye. So I mean, you, you have to work out of the box if you want to be uh, popular. Yes. If we, if we use these squares to divide our our nodes, doesn't the scale of each feature? Yes. No. 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 So, so oh, oh, it's very good remark. Sorry. Yes. Uh, you're completely right here. Uh, the scale of the output y completely matters. You no. Know, you uh, you're right. I mean, when I was talking, when I was thinking about features, uh, I was thinking about the features about x. You know, and it's also because, you know, I wanted to illustrate uh, decision trees uh, for regression because all the other models are going to be about regression. But I think in most tutorials, out of the box, decision trees are mostly illustrated on classification tasks. And so for classification tasks, mm -hmm. you know why it's an integer lab label. You don't care about it. And that's why I forgot. No, no, it's, it's very good. It's a very good remark. Obviously here, you know, I also went quickly. I told you that we are going to pick the mean value in each leaf uh, and that it's equivalent to minimizing a least square objective. Obviously what you can do is you can instead decide to pick the median, you know, and minimize, uh, which is more robust. And if you pick the, med the median, then once again, uh, you are robust to, to this uh, rescaling of the, of the features, but it's going to be more expensive, okay? The, this kind of dichotomy between non-robust uh, Euclidean methods uh, that work with least squares, that work with sum, and that are cheap to implement because they rely on the sum, on the sum operation. Um, sorry, it's, it, 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 it's a big sentence. Uh, I want to say that, you know, in the final lecture of the class, we're going to talk about algorithms, about bottlenecks, uh, and I think that's going to appear uh, very often is that what is very easy to implement, the methods that are very easy to implement are the methods that rely on sums and multiplications, because this is what we have on our hardware. Uh, you have uh, dedicated chips that compute sums and multiplications, and sum and multiplications, intrinsically, they are linked to a Euclidean metric, they are linked to a least square objective, and this is not very robust. And in many applications, you would rather use a median because it's much more robust, 
but a, a median, just computing a median instead of a mean is much more expensive. Okay? And sometimes it's not that expensive, but it's much less supported, you know, by PyTorch or whatever. And so uh, it's unfortunate, but often you have to make a choice between using a non-robust but fast method and a robust but more expensive method. And a big part of my work is to try to mitigate this problem, you know, to, to lower uh, the performance gap between the types of methods. So, but okay, thanks for the question. Uh, okay, so that's about the selling points, but as we've seen, okay, trees, they also tend to overfit very quickly and to produce uh, blocky results. So this is why, uh, this is why regularization methods uh, have been designed uh, to mitigate this issue, usually at the cost of interpretability. We are going to see that even if you stay within the realm of uh, trees, regularization method, they use, they aggregate maybe a hundred uh, trees. That's why we call them forests. Uh, and when you do that, obviously having a hundred trees uh, is much less uh, easy to, on the eye than uh, having just one nice tree that you can show to doctors. So, okay, since we, we decided to talk about uh, regularization, the first regularization, the first regularization strategy is to use what we call a boosted sequence of trees. So the idea is that we want to avoid uh, using trees of depth more than four, okay. because we've seen that uh, the complexities uh, grows way too fast. So let's say that on this kind of simple data, we want to stick to trees of depth uh, to so just uh, two thresholds. So you say, okay, that's fine. But if I only use one tree of depth two, one shallow tree, I'm not going to go very far. And I'm not going to get very high uh, accuracy. And so instead, what you can decide to do is to fit iteratively a sequence of shallow trees on residuals, on pre prediction errors, and then consider the sum of those trees as your uh, total model. So this is what I illustrate here. We have our same toy data set, five samples, uh, okay, X, Y. And okay, if I use one tree of depth two, I get uh, this, uh, this split. Then I can focus on the residual error. So here's something which is a little bit positive, something a little bit negative, something which is quite negative, a bit negative, quite positive. This is what I display here. And this is the difference between your ground truth prediction, your ground truth regression, and uh, the output of your first model. And then you say, I'm going to try to fit a tree, a second tree of depth two, so a very shallow tree to this residual. This is what I do here. And then I consider as, uh, as a total model, the sum of those two trees. So it's good because now, you know, instead of having an exponential complexity, in the depth, you have a linear complexity of the decision in terms of the number of trees. It, it, it's a way of, meeting, of managing complexity while staying within the realm of trees and so while keeping uh, all those nice properties about robustness, about the values, etc. Okay, so, I mean, but this is very brutal here because, you know, as a residual, uh, we picked the immediate, uh, I mean, we, we picked y minus the output of tree one in real life what you want to do uh, is go a little bit slower and maybe you know just remove uh, y minus 0 0.1 times uh, the output of tree one and iteratively uh, fit uh, feature feature sum of decision trees so you're going to have to use maybe a hundred trees to get similar accuracy but in practice it's going it's going to look much smoother and mm -hmm. easier on the eye so this parameter uh, here is really equivalent to a learning rate in what you do. And actually, you have lots of nice interpretations about this method. You can understand, uh, you can understand it as a kind of gradient descent in the space of trees instead of as a gradient descent in the space of neural networks. And this is why the, uh, all the famous libraries that implement those algorithms, they are called like uh, extreme gradient boosting or gradient boosting. That's uh, gradient boosted models, et cetera. So that's for the regularization. And uh, let's just look at, at an illustration in dimension one and two. So here I have my same data sets and one tree of depth three. Okay, it's a simple decision tree. I mean, it, it looks okay with moderate complexity. So you're happy because it captured this kind of bowl-like shape. 
but you know you still have a fairly uh, uh, large training error so you'd like to do better so maybe you can use three three trees of depth three maybe five maybe a hundred okay and this is what it looks like you see that you reach a high training accuracy with a relatively smooth model you know so here to go from there to there you know, the, the model learn a kind of slope yeah, and especially here you know instead of having one big uh, very positive value across the whole domain you see a progressive uh, downturn from this very positive value to this very negative value yeah, out of the box for a super simple method it's quite nice so this is the first regularization strategy the second very popular regularization strategy is what we call random forests. Now the idea is that you have your data set, you have five points. And with, in practice, you're really worried about outliers. You want your final models to be robust to a few samples. Uh, basically, you want to know how much your final model is influenced uh, by a few outliers that may have outlandish uh, values of y, a given value of x. So in order to generate data sets that have the same statistical properties as your original data set, but are not exactly your original data sets, what we like to do is to pick uh, bootstrap samples. I don't know if uh, you've already heard about this. Uh, okay, bootstrap samples, it just means, okay, I had five points. So maybe I'm going to generate five new points by picking points uh, by picking five points at random in this small data set. Uh, but obviously, if I pick it without replacement, I'm going to get a bijection. I'm going to retrieve my original data set. So uh, I decide that I'm going to pick uh, five new points in this original data set with replacement. And so it means that my my new uh, pseudo data sets, my, my bootstrap subsets may contain uh, repetitions. So here, basically, this point was picked once, this point was picked twice, this point was, wasn't picked, this point was picked once, this point was picked once. And on this subset, you learn uh, this. You learn this decision tree of depth two. Then you repeat the experiment on another bootstrap samples, another bootstrap sample, another bootstrap sample. And what you get, is you get a collection of shallow trees uh, that capture different aspects of your data. And the good property is that if you average them, you get something smoother that is still completely uh, grown out of trees. So it's very convenient uh, in practice and that may have better generalization properties. So that's it. Let's... I don't understand how you construct the bootstrap. Okay. So, uh, so okay. Here I have five points. Uh, basically, so uh, to to construct this sample, I just say uh, I just use NumPy to generate uh, an array of integers, random integers between one and five, and without any constraint on bijectivity, etc. So maybe I pick one, two, two, four, five. Okay. Then I do that. I get uh, I get one bootstrap sample. And okay. I do, so you don't add those or anything like that? Not at all. Mm -hmm. No, no. So, I mean, here, you know, they, you know, they, they are uh, a little bit translated. It's just for visualization. Okay. Because otherwise, they, they would be uh, one, one uh, on top of each other. Okay, so just, uh, just yes. pick a... Uh, yes, yes, yes. So, what's the goal of uh, bootstrapping? What, what, what? What's the goal? What's the goal? Yeah. The goal is to, is to generate, uh, basically, samples that have similar statistical properties, but where basically you, you expect that in most bootstrap samples, you won't have outliers. I mean, or basically if here you had one outlier, probably it won't appear in the majority of bootstrap samples. And so it, using bootstrapping will allow you to see what would the decision tree look like if this outlier was not present and if this outlier was not present. And so you expect that on average, it mitigates uh, the noise. And in practice, you're going to see that it also uh, allows you to retrieve uh, 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 smoother decision lines. So, you know, I, I mean, 
uh, your colleague just said, maybe we, we could add noise. Okay? And this would be another way of trying to mitigate uh, outliers, etc. But the problem is that if you, if you want to add noise, you need to understand your data a little bit. You know, like uh, adding noise on a scalar value, maybe you're going to pick a Gaussian, maybe you're going to pick a Poisson noise. On categorical data, it's very hard to, to add noise. So, I mean, all those more mathematical models, uh, they look fancy, but uh, they are not that convenient. Whereas with Bootstrap, you know, you, uh, it's, it's purely non-parametric, etc. Yes. In average, the altair will appear as many times as you know, points. Yes, yes, yes. But at least you're going to have seen some decision trees that were not impacted by outliers. And so you expect that, uh, I mean, obviously it depends on the, it's not a magic formula, uh, but if your uh, if your if your way of training the decision trees are basically if your base estimators were trained in a way which is not outlandish, probably it can allow you to to mitigate that. So so we have put more weight on uh, on uh, samples where we don't have the on on the trees trained on samples where we don't have uh, outliers. No. Yeah. So so the thing is that. You don't know which samples are outliers or not. So, you know, I mean, this is just a good heuristic uh, to, to try to see, uh, basically, to try to, I mean, what we know is that for every sample, we will have seen a decision tree where the sample uh, was not present. So, you know, it's at least a property that is guaranteed by this rule of thumb. Um, I mean, it's not great, but if you if you don't know what you're doing, it's it's, it's at least a, mm -hmm. a good thing. How do you know your bootstrap samples are from the same um, distribution as the original data set? Oh, so no, no, you you, you don't know that, uh, and, and 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 actually, it's very likely, it's very likely that it, they do not come from the same distribution, because your original data set, if it came from a continuous uh, generation process. The likelihood of having repetitions is infinitesimal, is extremely small. You know, it's essentially zeros. Whereas if you do bootstrap, you are guaranteed to have repetitions. But you know, it's it just that. I mean, the the good thing about this method is that it it works on any kind of data. So, uh, but if they're not from the same distribution, what's the information gain with this new data? I mean. It's not the same distribution, but it's still it's still close. I mean, at least you know that on average you have uh, the same range of values between x and y. You have the same dynamic. Probably you, you also have the same correlation. You know, for instance, maybe what you could do is, for instance, just fit a Gaussian to uh, to the x values, fit a, ga a Gaussian to the y values, and then generate samples independently. But then, if you do that, you completely destroy the correlation structure if it was present. Whereas with this very simple bootstrap rule of thumb, if there was correlation, it's still there. And and if there was no correlation, it's not there anyway. So it's uh, basically, you know, I mean, those are all very good questions, but, you know, I, I started learning about those statistical rule of thumbs, not... Uh, I mean, not early in my PhD career or whatever. And initially, you know, I mean, this looks very hand wavy. But the thing is that adding Gaussian noise is super hand wavy too. You know, it's just that we we have symbols, uh, and so we think that it's grounded, and then we say, oh, but we have um, normal convergence theorems that tell us that Gaussian noise appears, but they do not really hold in practice. I mean, if you look at my, for instance, if you look at my localization data, it's not a Gaussian at all. So, uh, you know, those non-parametric heuristics uh, have a, maybe have a good thing, uh, which is that first they are easy to deploy in any case, and their limitations are quite obvious to you. Like immediately you raise your hand, you say, no, I don't like this, it looks look strange. Whereas if you, hide, if you hide your opinions and if you hide your biases behind some kind of mathematical or pseudo-mathematical noise model, you hide things, uh, but you're not really more rigorous. So I'd say basically the combination of simplicity and transparency is why those type of techniques are so popular among statisticians. Okay. 
<laughs> yes, and it's really nice that you ask questions. <laughs> Thankfully, so uh, so let's look at the type of results. You know, I mean, at the end of the day, people just come up with this method. They say, "Oh, it looks nice," and that's good. Uh, so that's uh, yeah, that's what we really do. Uh, and then you try to find post post hoc justification for why it works on certain classes of problems. Okay, so here, uh, okay, just. Uh, if, you, if I use one tree of depth three, uh, basically I just get a, a, sing, a single decision tree that was computed on a bootstrap subset of the original sample. So here, for instance, it's quite clear that in my bootstrap sample, uh, this point and this point weren't picked. You know, otherwise uh, the, the, the leaf here would be higher. So that's fine. Okay, I mean just that with one tree, it's completely useless. But then if you add two trees. Uh, five trees, a hundred trees, you get something that looks nice. Uh, with a hundred trees of depth three, you get a pretty regularized decision rule. And so the model, you know, it still follows uh, here the axis of the feature space, but it's smoother. And then, uh, I mean, I have friends who did their PhD on random forest, try to find classes of problems where this is a good idea, where this is probably a good idea. And so you can say that just that. You have classes of problems where doing linear regression is probably a good idea. As a data scientist, or maybe as someone who is more interested by applications, the important thing to have in mind is first know what are those archetypal cases. And second, and this is what we're doing today, have in mind those archetypal results. You know, like if you think random forest, you should think about this picture. Okay, this is what a random forest looks like. And then, depending on the data, you know, uh, decide if this looks like a good prior to you or not. Okay. So now, okay, this was uh, the decision tree propaganda. Uh, but then, uh, obviously, some features may require more work. Okay. So you always need to understand the context. So here, a simple example. I look at, uh, let's say that I have two features about people. I know about their height. I know about their weight. And let's say that I'm interested in predicting uh, their heart, their heart health, something like that. Well, as you know, uh, the, or diabetes, uh, basically those type of illnesses are related to how overweight people are. And the thing is that if you look at the overweightness of people in this space of weight height, well, it doesn't follow cleanly one of the axes because obviously to be overweight, you have to weigh a lot, but you also have uh, not to be too tall because, you know, if you, ate, if you weigh 80 kilos, but uh, you, uh, you are my size, it's still fine. Okay. So, so let's assume that this is a type of signal that you want to regress. Well, if you were trying to fit uh, this kind of signal with a, with a, be, with a vanilla tree-based methods, it would never work because you would have to to learn those diagonals uh, by iteratively uh, fitting decision trees. It would be very cumbersome. But obviously, what you should do instead is to add a new feature that comes from your discussion with domain experts. So here, the body mass index, which is weight divided by the square of the height, so super nonlinear. And as you know, this is going to be a good indicator for many health problems. And a simple threshold on the body mass index is going to make sense. Okay. Another example, maybe uh, let's look at uh, postal codes. You know, applying uh, threshold on postal codes completely useless. Okay, it's a recipe for disaster. If you pick uh, just all the departments whose digits start with six, you get a, a randomish uh, picture of friends. Whereas, uh, so you know, maybe if you have access to postal codes in a data set, maybe you could replace this feature with another feature that is related to the department, but that you fetch in another table that may be more informative for your problem. So maybe average income, those kind of things. Finally, another very common type of data that you're going to, count, to encounter is the time steps. You know, every, even every time you, you, you create a poll, a poll in a Google Sheets, Google Forms, uh, you're going to get time steps. And applying uh, a time step uh, threshold on those kind of unique timestamps, you know, like that count how many seconds passed since uh, January the 1st, 1970, 
is going to be totally useless. If you want to do interesting things with times, you first have to apply um, periodic uh, feature extractors that turn this big number into a number of about years, a number of about months, a number of about hours. So just, you know, immediately, as soon as you try, as you start to think about a uh, real issue, you see that you have to do some kind of feature engineering to make it work. And just assuming that, that your data lives in a Euclidean space uh, is dangerous. So that's fine, but, you know, sometimes, uh, even if you do this kind of feature, feature engineering, the input features are not going to be good enough. So, for instance, uh, you know, we've seen that uh, last week that if we take a picture, then uh, a decision on a, on a radio cannot depend on just five uh, different pixel values. Okay? You, you need to take into account the global uh, structure of the signal, and this is going to be very hard to do with a sparse model. So, tree models, they cannot process raw pixel values. And lately, so it's very common in imaging sciences, in radiology, to try to handcraft features for this type of data and then apply a decision trees. And this is known as radiomics. In fact, lots of software that relies on this. That's fine, but it only takes you so far. And so in 2022, we try to go beyond those approaches. Typically, we use neural networks, etc. Okay. And so maybe a reason why decision trees are not ubiquitous uh, in the MVA is because of the V. Okay. Historically, historically the MVA is about imaging, signal processing. And those are two fields where decision trees are much less useful than in uh, the general data science ecosystem. So as a conclusion, tree-based models, they are highly interpretable. They are well suited to high quality heterogeneous features and they are super easy to use because you have access to great libraries. Like you type XGBoost, like GBM, scikit-learn, you find great packages that you can even deploy, you know, on a super large clusters or on a, a smartphone. You have great documentation. I mean, overall, it's a very major field, which is great. Uh, if you're a user, maybe if you're a PhD student, it's not so great. But uh, if, you, if you want to use a method to do something else, it's fantastic. On the other hand, they produce non-smooth results, typically piecewise constants, uh, and they are biased along the axis of the feature space. And this type of axial, uh, axial bias is a major limitation if you work with homogeneous features so let's think pixel values, audio signals, or something that really matters to me, uh, 3D XYZ coordinates. You know, me typically my data set, uh, those are meshes, contains uh, XYZ coordinates. And as you know, the XYZ coordinates are completely arbitrary, you know, the choice of the basis. So if you start showing to doctors an algorithm, which is obviously biased along the X or Y axis, it's, uh, it's obviously not good enough. So that's why we are motivated to do something else. And so maybe uh, the most simple method that does something else is k-nearest neighbors. Does the correlation between variables and partially resolved from the same case or? Partially resolved? Um, so no, a correlation between variables. Yes. So, yes, yes, yes. So basically, as you've seen, it's not super well suited to that. You know, that was, a, this example was a bit about that, like, Basically, you, you do great along the axis, but the thing is that a decision tree of depth D only uses D variables at a time. So for instance, if you stick to decision trees of depth three, you're never going to be able to capture interactions between four different variables. So it, 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 uh, the, how well decision trees are going to work depends on the properties of your data set or your cloud of points in your feature space. So ideally, you'd want to have your classes well separated along the axis. But if, as here, your classes are more like separated by a diagonal, it's a, it's a bit problematic. So, so here, when we consider a uh, body mass index, yes. we keep the weight and the height and give it to the model or just the body? No, so here, I mean, in a very simple example, you could even discard uh, weight and height. Here, basically, uh, Discarding weight and height and replacing them with body mass index in your feature space, it corresponds to, ch to a change of basis. Instead of using this basis, so first axis, second axis, you just have one axis which runs along the diagonal. And the good thing is that with this axis, so this feature, 
obese people and uh, people who are too thin are clearly separated by a single threshold uh, you know, across the axis. That's not a feature. Yeah, just can you explain why it is biased uh, along the feature? Yeah, that's exactly the next slide. So yeah, perfect. So that's uh, this. Yeah. Is that if it, the seven trees? They were by iteratively applying thresholds. So the the, the leaves on your on your tree, so the, the regions in which your decision tree takes this value or this other value, it's it's a result of several uh, cuts by hyperplanes, actually, because so here I have a very simple diagram. I have two input features, x1, x2. And uh, I want to regress some kind of uh, scalar, uh, scalar data. And you see that, for instance, if I apply the threshold x1 is larger than 1, then it defines this red region of the plane. And x1 smaller than 1, it, it defines the blue region. Then if after that I define x2 larger than something, and it's going to, to give me a horizontal cut. But you see that the, those axial cuts are the geometric interpretation of decision trees. Uh, okay, and so this is where the axial bias comes from. And that's fine. You know, in many real-world instances, this is what you want. But as you've seen, especially for 3D geometry or in physics, you really don't want to see that. I mean, this kind of behavior, it's artifacts. And so instead, you can decide to use a square Euclidean metric. Mm -hmm. uh, Basically, you take, your, you, you take coordinates, maybe you, you, you subtract them if you want to compute the distance between two points, and then you take the square of the coordinates and you sum them. Like the, that's the uh, Pythagoras uh, theorem. And you know that this metric is going to be invariant to rotations. And a simple way of seeing that is that if I, if I display uh, all the points such that the square Euclidean metric is smaller than four, then I get a round ball. And when you see larger than four, mm -hmm. I get this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. and, and this ball, so this ball structure, doesn't, uh, doesn't re I mean, isn't defined according to the choice of axis for x1, x2 that you have chosen. So this is why if you want to define uh, a machine learning algorithm, which is invariant to the choice of basis, at least the choice of basis up to rotations, uh, then probably trying to rely on the square Euclidean metric is a good idea. Okay, and so the most vanilla way of doing that is to is to use a predictor that for every new point x is going to find the nearest k neighbors among all the points in the training data set. So essentially, we have a point, we compute all the square Euclidean distances to the point in the data set, and then we pick the k smallest values. It allows us to pick neighbors. And then we decide that the value of the predicted value of y for this new point is going to be the average of the values of y's uh, for, the, for the neighbors. Okay, so first, if I have k equal 1, I just retrieve a simple nearest neighbor interpolation. My decision rule is just a model that for every point x finds the closest training sample, and we just copy the value. So that's uh, we get super blocky. It looks like a badly overfitted tree in dimension one, but what's interesting in that in dimension two it doesn't look like a tree anymore. Like we have piecewise constant decision rule, but the the cells instead of being uh, defined along the axis, so basically we do not see the x and y axis in this image. We have sharp decision rule because we we decided to pick uh, k equal one, but uh, we have those polygonal cells. Okay, so here, I don't know if it's super clear for you, but for instance, this point is closer to this point than to this one and to this one. And so that's why the color here is the same as the color here. Okay. This, this diagram, it's known as the Voronoi diagram, if you've learned a bit of stationary geometry. So, fine. Okay, just a super simple way of gener having a regression. You know, the, the regression rule doesn't look worse than what we had with the decision trees. And, and we don't have this bias along the axis anymore. So, but obviously k equal one, it's a bit crude. So maybe we can do k equal to two. Okay, if you do k equal to two, now every point is going to look at its two nearest neighbors and pick the average value between the two. So now 
the basically the cells of the diagram become smaller because here you had a transition every time you changed uh, mm. your first or uh, basically you, you change value every time your nearest neighbor changed but now you change value every time your nearest neighbor or your second nearest neighbor changes so that's why you have a, a smaller tessellation if you want uh, of the plane Uh, and since we take average, it smooths out outliers a bit more. So now k equals three, k equals four, k equals five. So here k equals five on a data set of five of nine values, obviously it smooths out everything. So that's why we, we quickly converge towards the constants. But if you had thousands of samples, it would be uh, better. Okay. So that's the idea really. K nearest neighbor, the model just looks smoother and smoother. It's still, but it's still piecewise constant. Okay. So, but here maybe on this data set, the most pleasing one maybe is this one. Okay. Kind of smooth, you know, you, you retrieve this dynamic. I don't know. So, the main selling points of k nearest neighbors is that first they are insanely interpretable. Basically, uh, it's what we do in real life all the time. Uh, when someone asks you why you took this decision, you said, Oh, my problem looked like this previous problem. I decided to, 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 to do the same. Everyone understands what is happening. Second is that it's isotropic. Isotropic, it means that there is no uh, favor direction in the future space. So basically, we do not follow the axis anymore. And this may or may not be a good thing. But okay, 3D geometry is definitely a good thing. Second is that it's super easy to deploy. And it's an algorithm which is very fast, parallel, and uh, GPU friendly. Basically, if you want to implement that, even in high dimensional space, you say I have my points, I want to compute in parallel all the distances to the other points, and then I want to find the n smaller k smaller values, that's fine. Okay, in the, in the last lecture of the class, in the lecture 7 on algorithms, I'm going to show you how it's actually implemented on the GPU, etc. Because it's like the most fundamental uh, geometric uh, algorithm. And so it's very well packaged, it's scalable. So you, if you're interested, you can look at FICE, uh, which is, uh, I think, the A's line uh, for uh, fast approximate nearest neighbor search or similarity search, because it's kind of, it's kind of the same thing, uh, which is developed by Facebook. You have Keops, uh, which is a library that I developed for, especially for small, uh, small instances with less than a million points. And you have great resources, uh, great benchmarks, both on million scale data set and on billion scale data sets, okay, big N and benchmarks. And, you know, those, uh, those models, uh, maybe to you, they don't look as fancy as, uh, uh, as doing convolution on your networks. Maybe you think, it's not AI, no, but it's absolutely everywhere. Okay. Uh, uh, and so, especially uh, on, on, on websites, like Facebook or Twitter or Google, uh, I mean, it's very important to be able to solve those kind of nearest neighbor queries efficiently because a way of uh, fetching content for your web page, maybe your YouTube page, is to say that you have embedded content, you have embedded videos, YouTube videos in a vector space. Uh, and then using another network, using another model, you have embedded people in the same vector space. And then the question you ask when someone connects uh, itself to YouTube uh, is you say, okay, what are the K nearest videos around him? Uh, and I'm going to show uh, what are the most interesting videos for him, uh, for this person. And this is how you generate content. Uh, at least it's, it's a basic way of generating content for websites. Okay. And this is why you have so much industrial support for very large scale uh, nearest neighbor regression. Uh, and why, you know, why the, the reference library is developed by Facebook, Meta, as the people say. So that's fine. But major weakness is that unlike decision trees, KNNs, they require a good scaling of the input features. And that, you know, unlike those tree-based models, the Euclidean distance, it's very sensitive to the precise values of the feature X. And the thing is that when you make your sum, you compare together different features. You, you put in the same axis, different features. And so, you know, if you want to compare apple and oranges, then uh, immediately it starts to be uh, a bit uh, flaky. Okay. So out of the box, k nearest neighbors, they are not even robust to the choice of units for the columns of your data sets. You know, if, you, if you change from uh, millimeters per second and kilometers per hour, 
the numerical values of the features changing, and so the distance changes, the distance change, and so the, the model changes. So you know you have to realize that that uh, it's not nearly as robust as uh, as decision trees. So in practice, you certainly want to normalize uh, your input features using something that makes sense for your problem. The simplest way of doing that is to do a feature-wise rescaling using the standard deviation. You can do that with Excel. Uh, you just remove the mean for, from every column. You compute the standard deviation uh, and you rescale by that. And that's what we call normalization. You can also do it in a multivariate way. You know that takes into account correlations, uh, and that's what we know as principal component analysis. I assume that you're going to do that uh, in other MV lectures. And just for your information, computing a Euclidean distance between points, but not between the row features, but in PCA space, it's very well known in statistics. It's known as the Mahalanobis metric. And it's kind of the first example in statistics machine learning of a data driven metric between points. It was in the very early 20th century uh, in India. I think it was about the, the shapes of the scale of the people. Uh, and finally, you know, instead of applying the simple scalings, maybe what you can do is you can just equalize the feature histograms. So it means that for every column, instead of taking the numerical value, you sort your columns, and your new your new features are just the rank the ranks uh, of uh, the features in each. So this way, you are completely invariant. You stay in, and you retrieve an ordering based uh, algorithm. So. But here, you know, I'm not going to tell you that one method is better than the other. It's, it's, it's very, very much problem dependent. But you have to know that this matters. So summary on those simple methods is that they are very interpretable and they are suited you know, arch in an archetypal way. Three methods are, are very well suited to heterogeneous data. k nearest neighbors, it's very suited to homogeneous features. Both methods are super well understood, as you can imagine. They are well packaged, they are easy to deploy, and they are excellent baselines for interpolation. You know, if, you, if you just want to take average values of previous samples, it's perfect. And so, you, know, you don't need to fit uh, super large neural networks to do that. Unfortunately, you have two major downsides, two major limitations, let's say. The first is that we always produce uh, non-smooth piecewise constant uh, decision rules. So maybe it's not a problem, but you know, uh, I mean, have lots of problems in physics where you, you know, if you want to interpolate a trajectory, you don't want to have this kind of weird stutter. You, know, you want to 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 find the, uh, the, the continuous interpolation of your data. Second, is that both methods are quite local and they do not estimate uh, global trends, or at least none of the methods, for instance, allows you to predict values of Y that are outside of the range that we have already seen. Because either you pick a value of y which already exists in the data set, or you put an or you or you, or you use an average, but you, you never extrapolate. So out of the box, it's not a natural fit to uh, to do extrapolation or forecasting using pure decision trees or pure nearest neighbors. And just you, you can combine this with other models, and then you, you you can try to get the best of both worlds. Okay, this is what people do in research, but out of the box, it's not natural. So. What is the natural way of doing forecasting? Well, the simplest thing is to do linear regression. We're going to make a short break in just two minutes. So just as a reminder about uh, linear regression, well, you have your data set. Linear regression is just about choosing the weights, uh, one scalar weight for every feature that allow you to minimize a least square error when you just uh, take a weighted combination of your features. So maybe if you want to visualize what happens, you know, I could tell you, yeah, linear regression, it's a kind of arithmetic identity, you compute a covariance matrix, you invert it, etc. This is how you, you usually do it. But I'm afraid that if I do that, I'm going to do that in an hour for more complex methods, but if I, if I, do, if I do it too much, you're going to think that linear regression is something arithmetic, whereas neural network is something about uh, convex optimization and decision trees are about greedy algorithms. Okay, this is the way we usually understand those models. I mean, through their optimization algorithms, through optimization toolboxes, and that's fine because at the end of the day, someone has to implement the, the models. 
But the problem is that if you focus too much on the algorithms, you forget about the big picture. You forget that all those models, they kind of do the same thing. They are just, we are just fitting curves through data points. Okay, and so that's why instead of understanding linear regression, instead of fitting linear regression using a Cholesky decomposition, covariance matrix, and blah, 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 you can just fit it uh, using the same algorithm uh, as your favorite neural networks. You can just use gradient descent, Adam. I mean, it's, it's totally going to work. And actually, for very large scale linear regression problem with some regularization, this is what to do. Okay. All those uh, Cholesky decompositions, uh, linear algebra methods, uh, they work for small problems, but uh, you know they, they are. You can understand them more as great mathematical miracles that speed up the method, but not as uh, you know. Uh, uh, core elements uh, that explain the model. Just like the fast Fourier transform, it's fantastic. It explains why the Fourier transform is so used in signal processing, but it is not the Fourier transform. So here, let's look at this simple data set. I have my nine points, x1, y1, x2, y2, blah, 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 x9, y9. And when you do linear regression, you are just specifying uh, super naive neural networks, uh, f, that has two parameters. A, so the slope, and B, which is like the offset at the origin. And when A equals to zero, B equals to zero, point twenty-five, you have a constant. Okay, and so I have a constant, so no positive or negative correlation between X and Y. So uh, I just display like a, a, a white, uh, a, a white correlation link. But what you can do is you here you see that you have errors. This defines your loss function. I minimize it using gradient descent. So up, I do that. And progressively, after a few steps, it's, it's going very fast because it's convex. It's a convex optimization problem. I retrieve my linear regression. I retrieve a positive uh, correlation coefficient. And so here I display it you know, as, a, as a red uh, segment between x and y. And that's fine. So this is linear regression for you. It models a monotonic trend. And in many real life scenarios, just knowing if a feature is harmful or beneficial is already uh, good. Okay, so that's why right? linear regression is is so important. Uh, but you know, it, obviously, you only go so far because you you cannot handle uh, relationships such as this ball relationship, or you cannot really uh, model what is really happening is in this data here. So. We cannot, uh, using simple linear models, we cannot handle uh, uh, non-monotonic relationships between the, in the input X and the output Y. And so now you ask yourself, what should we do? And obviously the answer is you have to go back uh, to the doctors, trying to understand what is happening. And so we're going to take a break. Uh, and maybe, okay, so one of you asked a question. Uh, in the random forests, the points that are sampled n times will influence the tree split n times more than the other points. Is there an interest to just ignore a sample if it has already been picked once? Uh, so that's uh, that's a good question. Let's say, well, uh, I would assume that on statistical ground, it's better to pick it through the replacement. So that's, uh, you have better average properties. You know, if instead of destroying points, we just say, okay, I don't destroy, but I pick another one. And anyway, from a practical perspective, it's better uh, to pick the same number of points every time. At least, you know, if I think about linear regression or basically if your model is a black box, because maybe your model uh, uses a number of points as a normalization, you know, in, instead of taking uh, a sum of square distances, it's taking an average, you know, you never know. And the good thing with Bootstrap is that you, you ask zero question you generate uh, random samples that have the exact same shape, exact same, a, a distribution that looks like your original data, no questions. And so, I mean, even if this was the only argument, it, it would still be a decent argument uh, for just uh, picking it with replacement. I mean, so the, so the great thing about this type of non-parametric uh, rule of thumb is that you can apply it in a really uh, any setting. Uh, and so, I mean, once people know about it, you know, consensus, uh, people know about the main pitfalls, you know, it's, it's not just a community effect or a, or a bad idea. I mean, having uh, 
standard measurements for how do I uh, compute the confidence interval? How do I uh, average models? I mean, it's it's a it's a, it's a good um, it's a good it's a good thing. So let's uh, come back to the uh, yeah. <clears throat> and uh, we're good to go. So okay, what what? Let's say that we had a dinner with uh, our doctors, and we told them that okay, linear linear, <laughs> uh, linear regression is fine, but you know you only capture that uh, sugar is bad for you, uh, alcohol is bad for you, vegetables are good. You know it's it it's too crude, and you want to do something a bit more complex. And so maybe they are going to tell you why don't you introduce some intermediate variables in your model. You know, maybe DOM and experts are going to suggest a step-by-step -step process to compute a quantity of interest. So, you know, if you interact with them, let's say that <clears throat> here this is a slice of uh, an aorta, so uh, the big artery uh, in your thorax, and it's important in cardiography to be able to compute the perimeter, uh, the circumference of this aorta. And you say, okay, I want to go from this input to this output. And then, you know, you, you remember what we said last time about uh, wavelets, uh, edge detectors, and you know that if you use a simple convolution with an horizontal uh, filter, you're going to get a vertical edge detector. If you do a convolution with another filter, you're going to detect horizontal edges. And so you say, okay, if I'm able to compute, <clears throat> if I'm able to to, to detect vertical edges, uh, horizontal edges, then maybe I can then aggregate this and I'm going to get my parameter. So, I mean, it's a great, uh, it's a great way of being creative to say, I'm going to add new things and it's going to be modular. And so maybe what you can do is to say, instead of having a single linear regression between the input X and the output Y, I can add two intermediate linear regressions. Maybe my model will have more parameters, but you think it's going to be more powerful. And so here, X, I apply a first linear model. So I compute G1, which is A1X plus B1. I compute a second uh, linear model, G2, which is A2X plus B2. And then I combine both linear models uh, to, to provide my output Y. So C1, G1 plus C2, G2 plus D. So now my model, instead of having two parameters, it has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven parameters. But all of them, you know that I can encode them as matrices, as arrays. I can still define a least square error. And so I, I can just optimize. And so let, let's see what it does. And okay, it's underwhelming. <laughs> and why is it underwhelming? That's because all those linear combinations, they cancel each other. Um, or let's say, Taking a linear combination of linear combination just gives you a linear combination. So if you apply this methodology with purely linear models, you do not expand the expressivity of your class and function. And so that's why what to do in practice is that we add non-linearities. We, we try to break the linearity property. And the simplest way of doing that is to take an absolute value or maybe uh, just to take the positive part. You know, so we had... Uh, we're going to decide that G1, instead of being A1X plus B1, it's going to be the positive part of A1X plus B1. So it's equal to A1X plus B1 if A1X plus B1 is positive, otherwise it's zero. So instead of having linear functions, I have a linear function with a hinge or an elbow, you know, as we say in French, in France, uh, a coude. And so now here I have two variables and I have two elbows, two, two hinges. And so my model now describes a piecewise affine, a piecewise linear uh, function with two hinges. So the first one is here and the second one is there. So then I can optimize with, uh, with, with just stochastic gradient descent or gradient descent. And I get this and, you know, I'm happy. I, ca I, I captured uh, something interesting about the, about the problem. So the good thing now is that it's very easy to, or it seems to be very easy to manage complexity. If you want to get a better fit, maybe you're going to say, I'm going to add more neurons. So instead of having just two intermediate variables, I have four, G1, G2, G3, G4. Because I think I have one, two, 
three elbows, maybe the fourth one isn't used here, like the constraint is never saturated. And, and then I optimize. And, oh, okay. Then it's a bit underwhelming, surprisingly. Okay. Like previous time with few neurons, it, it, it got two hinges, it got good fit. Now I have four neurons. I expected four hinges, but no, no, I, I just get one. So that's a bit surprising. And actually, the, the, the cause for this is that the optimization problem with respect to the coefficients of my intermediate variables is not convex anymore. Like, it's not a super simple linear regression problem anymore. It's something uh, a bit different. So if you look at the optimization landscape, you have different local minima. And so the result that you get with those neural networks, as you probably already know, depends heavily on where you started and what is the optimization procedure that you found. And here, visibly, we are stuck uh, in a bad local minima. Okay. So we say, okay, not too bad. Maybe I'm going to add more neurons. So now I have two layers. I have a first layer of intermediate variables and a second layer, and then my output. So doing that, I create more cuts. I create more hinges. And the thing is that with hinges of hinges, that you know it, it grows uh, quadratically instead of uh, going uh, linearly. It's a bit like okay, if, if I have uh, cuts in the horizontal direction and then I allow cuts in the vertical direction, you get more flexibility. So it's going to be better. And yes, okay, maybe if you had lots of neurons, maybe you're going to uh, to be able to express uh, a very wide class of uh, piecewise linear functions, but you also run the risk of a, of, a, of a fitting badly. Okay, here you see that a super overparametrized neural network, at least one random uh, optimization with, I think it's ADAM, or maybe it's stochastic gradient descent. Okay, here I got bad overfitting. Uh, or at least uh, I just got piecewise linear interpolation, which may be decent for interpolation, but for extrapolation, like here it decides to go up. Here we decide to go left. I have zero control on what's happening. So that's basic. Uh, that's basic neural, net, uh, neural networks. And so in the literature, uh, those models, you know, they've been studied for a long time, at least since the 1950s. And they are known as fully connected neural networks or multi-layer perceptrons. Because, you know, back in the day, it was perceptual. So this is a picture that you should have in mind. So in 1D or, and in 2D, a multi-layer perceptron with one hidden neuron, you have a piecewise linear model with at most one hinge. So here in the 1D case, I didn't use a hinge, but I'm clearly in the linear regime. Here in the 2D example, I don't use a hinge and I'm clearly in the constant regime, just by luck. Like the optimizer, which is non-convex uh, and maybe stochastic, doesn't choose them all. So now I can say, okay, I'm going to add more neurons. Now I have 10 hidden neurons, just one layer. And I get a piecewise linear model with at most 10 hinges. The model uh, doesn't, the optimizer may not choose them all, but you can see, so here it doesn't choose the hinges. Here it decided, you know, to, you can understand it a bit as a sheet of paper which has been folded. And the more neurons you add, the more folds you, you allow to fit the distribution of your data points. So this is 10 hidden neurons. Then 20 hidden neurons, oh, miracle, here it worked. Uh, here still kind of works. Uh, 50, 50 hidden neurons. We add more and more complexity. 100 hidden neurons, and maybe okay if we here like the, the number of cuts or the number of hinges that is used by the model is proportional to the number of neurons because I have a very shallow neural network with just one layer. So if I want to go deeper, you know, if I if I go deeper, if I allow cuts of cuts, I create. Uh, uh, I create more cuts for the same computational budget. And maybe I, I allow the reuse of some intermediate variables. Like, you know, it's not very clear when you look at these pictures, but why not? So here it's a deeper multi-layer perceptron with two hidden layers, uh, two layers of 100 hidden neurons. So at most something like 10,000 hinges. And you see that here are the, we got this picture. Uh, hard to interpret. Here it doesn't look great. Here it looks fine. Uh, even deeper, okay, surprisingly, it became smoother. And now even deeper, now it's super non-smooth. So, you know, it looks like a smooth origami, something strange, but okay, this is neural networks for you. 
uh, probably you've already trained one of them. You see that, I mean, this is highly stochastic and reliable. So, I mean, if you look at vanilla fully connected neural networks, you can think about the following strengths and weaknesses. The first strength is that this method is super modular and easy to extend. And as you know, this is the main selling point of the method, right? The fact that this idea of introducing intermediate variables, try to model uh, decision flows, allow people to be creative. And then you know that for image processing, you can think of constraining the, uh, the, the input weights to be convolutions. And you know that if you do convolutions with deep convolutions on image classification tests, then suddenly it works. Well, it works much better. So, I mean, this is, this is a massive selling point, which is not shared by many other mathematical methods. Mm -hmm. so, second thing is that it's just, you can understand vanilla neural network as a very simple way of implementing high dimensional piecewise linear models. And this is useful. And finally, as you know, neural networks are extremely well supported now. It wasn't the case 20 years ago, but today it's definitely the case, both on CPU and on GPU. So you can just download PyTorch TensorFlow, you find, you find tons of tutorials, it's very easy to get started, and it's very easy to scale uh, your models. So, I mean, those are all important factors. But unfortunately, the optimization of those neural weights, you know, the coefficients of my piecewise affine functions, is not a convex problem anymore. You know, I don't know if you follow the class on convex optimization, but convex optimization is the easy. Uh, it's uh, life is easy. You only have one, uh, one minimum, one optimum. Basically, if you want to find a minimum, just follow the gradient. In high dimensions, it's a bit more complex than that because you might get lost. But okay, you you know how to decrease. Whereas here with neural networks, due to our way of introducing nonlinearities, we have destroyed this nice property. And so instead, we must rely on non-deterministic stochastic solvers. Uh, and just this, I think, already uh, <laughs> is very damaging. You know, like uh, I did my postdoc in a, in a lab uh, on geometric deep learning. So it's this kind of method, but on steroids. Uh, and personally, yeah, I think that the the fact that the, the result of a training procedure is stochastic is really damaging to the scientific process as a whole. Because you know, if you do experiments, maybe in physics or in mathematics, you, you say, I have a hypothesis, I test it with an experiment, I get a result, is it better, is it not better? You know, you, you, you can hope to have a monotonic uh, path towards progress, we've seen in the ideal case. But the problem now with neural networks, especially if they take two days to train, is that this randomish uh, procedure means that you are never confident about the steps that you have taken. Maybe if you have added something, if you have added a module, if you have changed a layer, and suddenly you get better performance, you, you're never fully sure if, uh, if this is just due to chance or, the, or if this is due to a genuine improvement of your method. And to be sure about that, you would need to repeat the experiment maybe 10 times mm -hmm. or 100 times, but obviously this is expensive. And so few people do it, okay? And so you, you Basically, the, the, the stochasticity of the optimizer encourage people to turn away from hypothesis testing <coughs> and to see it more as a kind of a slot machine. You know, where you say, okay, I, I took the parameter, I put a slot, I wait two days, this is literally how, how we work, and then hooray, it, I beat the state of the art. You know, it's a bit, uh, you know, it's a bit bad. I mean, it really works like that in many places. So I, I think it's a bit of a... Uh, of a shame. Second, you know, in the same vein, is that as you've seen, performance and smoothness of the final uh, regression model are not simply correlated to the number of neurons and layers. Like, ideally, in a, if you want to iterate quickly and find quickly the good hyperparameters for your models, you'd like something where, okay, if you have few parameters, it's smooth. If you have a lot of parameters, it's non-smooth. And then you, you train it once, twice, and you know by binary search, you quickly find the parameter values that corresponds to the level of smoothness, uh, the level of data fitting that you want. But the problem here with neural networks is that uh, since they are 
I mean, since this behavior is so erratic, we do not have a straightforward path towards a hyperparameter optimization. And this is why you have currently so many people, so many uh, grad students, uh, PhD students, who essentially spend their days running those experiments with basically doing research in the space of, parameter, of hyperparameters until they find uh, something that works. You know, and maybe that's fine if you're doing research because you are paid full time to do something. But in the outer world, this is not really what you want. If you have a problem, you want, you want it to be solved in, in, one, in a week or in a day or maybe in five minutes, ideally. And uh, having this super blurry uh, uh, hyperparameter optimization step really damages the, the real life value of those models. So I think it's important for you to know that in most applications, the lack of, reprodu of reproducibility and interpretability on top of that is very often a, a deal breaker. Okay? So the reason why currently our generation, we spend so much time studying convolutional neural networks, studying those very complex models, it is not because they are so much better than, than everything else. It's just that those models are clearly useful for some classes of problems. Mm -hmm. Let's say image processing, uh, natural language processing, maybe some other things. And that it's very new that we're able to train them. So as young people, as researchers, we want to study the new things. So that's why we spend uh, uh, years uh, studying these objects because essentially the other models, they have already been studied. We already know everything easy there is to know about them. Okay? But new world doesn't necessarily mean better, it's just different. And neural networks, they give you a different set of trade-offs. Personally, I think it's great that it allows people to be creative. It allows people to very simply uh, include uh, domain-specific expertise into the model, you know, which is not something that is very easy to do when you have a strange mathematical formula. But the, the, the practical impact of this non-convexity uh, really shouldn't be underestimated. And I, think, I think in academia, where we are full-time researchers, we tend to downplay uh, how bad the problem really is. So now that's fine. So we say, oh, who cares about neural networks? Maybe uh, 15 years ago, you know, I wouldn't even have talked about neural networks because I would say, oh, obviously, this is not good. Obviously, now we know that. No, no, it was worth studying, but uh, I mean, when you see this picture, it really isn't clear that neural networks are worth studying. So instead, let's just stick to something simple, something that comes from high school, which is polynomial interpolation. So what is polynomial interpolation? Well, you can understand it as the extension, the natural extension of linear regression. So first, constant polynomials of degree zero are just constants. So here I have my problem in dimension one, my problem in dimension two, fitting a polynomial of degree zero just means taking the average value as a constant. And then uh, performing linear regression is just, you, you can see it as finding weights for the following features. In dimension one, you try to find weights, two weights for the two features, which are the constant one and the linear uh, coordinate S. In dimension two, you have three degrees of freedom. You have the constant one, you have X, and you have Y. So this is linear regression, you know what it is. Now what about quadratic regression? Quadratic regression in dimension one, you know that, it's about having one X and X2. So you have three degrees of freedom, and basically you fit a parabola. So in this data set, it looks great. In dimension two, what is interesting is that you don't have three degrees of freedom. You have six, because you have one, you have x, you have y, you have x squared, xy, and y squared. So anyway, it's important to realize that maybe when you look at the two pictures here in 1D, here in 2D, you say, oh, it's the same. You know, it, it looks the same. And if I look at the level sets of my function, you know, I get those conic, uh, uh, those conic shapes. Here, clearly, I have a hyperboloid. Uh, or, uh, uh, I have a horse, uh, a horse seller, no, I, I don't know, a uh, horse saddle, uh, clearly, but okay, you think the complexity is more or less the same, but okay, a, a, a word of warning, the complexity of polynomial regression grows much more quickly in high dimensional spaces than it does in uh, dimension one, just because you have to take into account all those interactions uh, between uh, between functions. So this is polynomial of degree two, polynomial of degree three, cubic, 
Okay, here you have four degrees of freedom in dimension one. In dimension two, you start to have more. So here it still looks manageable, but what happens in dimension four? In dimension four, you have five degrees of freedom for essentially nine numbers, in dimension, nine independent values of y in dimension one, and so you still get something reasonable. In dimension two, you see that I'm starting to overfit. You know, I, I, I'm looking at those strange shapes. It looks uh, a bit strange. And in a sense, I mean, it's normal because I only have 20 degrees of freedom, 20 independent values for Y, but I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. I have like 16 independent parameters. And so I have 16 independent parameters to fit 20 independent values, it's not a surprise that I'm starting to overfit. And you see, as soon as you try, as, as you start uh, using polynomials of degree five, then in dimension one, it still looks okay, even though here you start to have those strange polynomial interpolation artifacts. And in dimension two, it's over. We are just overfitting on the data set because we have more degrees of freedom than, uh, than independent values. Obviously, okay, polynomial of degree 10, everyone overfits, we're happy, it's garbage. So, and on top of that, you know, it's super numerically unstable. I mean, having, you know, relying on x at the power of 10 to take decisions. Uh, it's a bit of a recipe for disaster. So, that's it for polynomial regression. So, summary of the models that we've seen so far. First, we had those non-parametric methods, like tree-based models, which are robust, but are biased along the axis, and k nearest neighbor models, which are isotropic, but are sensitive to scaling. Then you have so-called parametric methods like linear regression, which is absolutely useful. You need to know what it is, but it's often too simplistic. And neural networks, which are very expressive, but unreliable. So for, at least for simple regression problem, it's not worth the effort. Finally, we've seen polynomial regression that started like a good idea, like it's just linear regression, but with new features, with polynomial features. Instead of having one x, y, I add polynomial features and I hope for the best. Uh, and the thing is that, okay, quadratic regression is worth knowing about, maybe cubic. Beyond that, it's completely useless in high dimensions. So what can you do? Well, yeah, an answer, uh, try to get a good in-between, get the best of both worlds for this class of problem can be kernel interpolation. This is something that's worth knowing about. And the idea here is that, you know, I, uh, I liked uh, the idea of polynomial regression, where you specify directly a linear parametric form for the model. You say f of a1, aj, x, so you have j independent parameters. And you say that the parameters that you're going to tune are going to have a linear impact on the, function, on the, on the model. So this sounds like a great idea to decouple statistical regression from modeling. Because maybe if you know your data, you're able to provide a good class of function, f1, f2, fj. So this is your modeling part. And then the statistical analysis, so the regression part of the problem, is just going to be an optimization on linear weights. And so optimization on linear weights with a squared uh, Euclidean distance as a loss function is going to be convex, and so it's going to be easy. It's going to be uh, reproducible. Okay, so you can think of it this way: like kernel methods are all about uh, uh, untangling modeling from statistical regression by allowing people to define uh, a smoothness or a class mm -hmm. of function that they believe is useful. So in practice, if you don't know what you're doing, typically you're going to use uh, functions that are just translated bumps. Mm -hmm. You're going to pick a function k, k of x minus y. You're going to call it the kernel of your method and say that your, uh, your model is just going to be a linear combination of translated kernel functions which are centered on your different samples. Okay, it looks like a good baseline. It just as a memory helper, maybe kernel, you know, it's the same word as corn. Like, it just means grain. So, either maize or wheat. But uh, the idea is that you, you have a fully-fledged method where use, the user or the data scientist only needs to provide a corn. So, 
uh, a function that define that describes the typical smoothness that we expect from our problem, and then everything else reliably grows and you get an output. So some common kernels, you know, you can, I don't know if you already encounter those kind of uh, functions, but typically people think about the exponential kernel. So just an exponential of minus a distance between two points, a Gaussian kernel, which is exponential of minus a square distance between the points, and maybe a quickly kernel, which is like, instead of having an exponential that kills uh, large values of the distance, you, you pick instead like one over one plus the square distance. You know, so something that decays that decay much more slowly. So when you look at the formula, maybe you, you know, I think you, you're, you're a bit impressed. Uh, I mean, by the, by the mathematical symbols, you know, you, you say, oh, exponential Gaussian are deep object. And in my experience, it's not really true. Okay, the only two parameters that matter for a kernel function, like the one that you should think about when you choose your kernel, are the smoothness around zero and the tail. Like how, how fast does it decay towards zero and how smooth, how smooth it is around the origin. And why? Because those two parameters describe two different properties about your regression model. You know, if your, if your kernel is very smooth uh, around zero, like a Gaussian, then it means that you want your model uh, yeah, to, to be very smooth. It doesn't have, it isn't allowed uh, to have sharp rises. So points should be correlated. But typically you're not going to get very good fit or very good uh, training error <laughs> on noisy data, because you're never going to be able to fit all the ups and downs that are due to noise. Whereas with an exponential kernel, you know, something picky, your model will know that, you know, an exponential, you can think of it as a Gaussian, but where you, you decided to make a, a small detour to fit uh, this value of one uh, at zero. That's the intuition between smooth and picky. And then se second parameter, does your kernel have a compact support or a heavy tail? So if your kernel has compact support and a Gaussian has compact support, you know, beyond five sigma is essentially zero, then it means that the value of a point uh, here, basically the, the value of y at a given point has zero influence or very little influence on the value elsewhere in the, in the, in the, in the data set. So it means that your, uh, your decision rule is going to be very local, a bit like a nearest neighbor interpolator, a smooth nearest neighbor interpolator. Whereas if you have a heavy tail, then it means that long range interactions exist. And so you allow the model to try to capture maybe something like a linear regression, etc. Okay, so I want to, to be clear for you that the formulas are important. Like it's important to know the basic formulas, but this is what really matters. And this is why I had no issue uh, drawing this Gaussian with Inkscape, you know, I didn't really plot a Gaussian because it doesn't really matter. What matters about the Gaussian kernel is that it's very smooth and that it has compact support in practice. So you can think of it as a smooth indicator function, whereas a Cauchy kernel, it's smooth but has uh, a heavier tail. Now, how do you choose the weights? Like, okay, we have decided that we're going to take a linear combination uh, of Gaussians or of uh, Cauchy kernels, but how do we pick the weights? Well, a first method, very simple, very easy, is to say, okay, maybe instead of using a linear combination, I'm going to use a, a fraction. I'm going to say that f of x is going to be the sum of the k of x minus xi yj. So as weights, I'm going to pick uh, the ground truth value on my data set for my function but I'm going to divide by uh, this normalization constant or this, this normalization term, which is the sum of the kernel values without the yj's. Okay, so th this method is known as Nadaraya-Watson uh, interpolation. So you assume that your kernel function takes positive values so that you're able to divide. And, you know, if you think a bit about it in terms of weights, basically the, the, the weights that correspond to the function k of x minus xj is yj divided by a normalization term. And so, you know, when Nandaraya Watson interpolation is, bar is barycentric interpolation for the weights between the ground truth values yj, 
with weights that are proportional to the values of this kernel function. Maybe just look at some examples. So here, Nadalia Watson interpolation in dimension one, dimension two, with a very smooth Gaussian kernel. Smooth Gaussian kernel with a deviation sigma, so the, the, the radius of my Gaussian kernel, it's 0 0.2. And, you know, this parameter value alone doesn't mean anything. Uh, a parameter value is only defined relative to the scale of the data set, because it's a factor that divides the distance. So here it's very important to know, you know, uh, to understand this picture, you need to know that the interval here has length one and the square uh, has side one. Okay, so 0 0.2, basically it's the distance between those two points. Yeah. So it means that here in my interpolation, you get this kind of, you get smoothness like a Gaussian function uh, of deviation sigma equals to 0 0.2. So we get smooth local averaging on the unit interval in square. So here you see that 0 0.2, it's like the distance between those two points. So even for this value of x, you know, you undershoot because you are influenced by your neighbors. Okay, so here, there it is. Now, well, if you want to get a tighter fit, well, you just have to decrease the value of sigma. You know, you decrease, the, you decrease your observation radius. And so now you switch to sigma equal to 0 0.1. Now you have much less mixing between the points, and so the curve starts maybe to overfit a little bit. And what's interesting here is that in 2D, you know, like for instance, these points only sees this neighbor. It doesn't care about the other one. Like the, the other ones, they are beyond five sigma. Uh, they don't exist anymore. Uh, it, so the decision rule clearly looks like uh, like a smooth KNN or a k-nearest neighbor uh, decision boundary. You know, this is the kind of picture that I wanted to show you. To show you that just because two methods are defined using very different equations, doesn't mean that they don't behave exactly the same. Okay. Yeah, but could we really um, describe it as a kernel method? Because uh, we have left the original formula with the, where the weights uh, right in, in, um, associated to each kernel is fixed, where we change the weights. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, exactly. So, I mean, in both cases, I'm doing interpolate for both methods. I'm doing interpolation with a kernel, so you can say it's kernel regression. And Wikipedia certainly thinks so. So that's what, you know, if you type kernel regression, first you have Nadalia Watson interpolation, and then you have what I'm going to show you uh, in five minutes, which is when you actually use a linear combination instead of a fraction, and which is known as kernel, as kernel ridge regression or Gaussian process regression. But yeah, and. and it's uh, no, anyway, it's not exactly a linear combination, but it's so close that uh, it fits. It fits this, and it fits exactly the same purpose, like allowing people to define their own smoothness using a function that they understand, and then extrapolating this knowledge to the whole data set. No, but, of course, I mean. It. So this is for a Gaussian kernel, so you know, very smooth, but very local. And now what happens if I take a Cauchy kernel, you know, one over one plus X squared. So it doesn't decay nearly as fast as, uh, as a Gaussian kernel. And so I get much more averaging towards the uh, mean value. Okay, so here, I mean, it looks underwhelming. Uh, clearly, uh, uh, everything is dampened towards the global average. But instead, if I use a pointy exponential kernel with the same deviation sigma, then you kind of see that you get a, close, a tighter fit to the training data because intuitively you had your smooth Gaussian interpolation and the curve trying to make a step to the right, a step to the left to fit, uh, to fit the training points. So depending on the problem, maybe this is what you want. So that's all well and good, but uh, none of those methods allow me to get a very tight fit. And so, what would you do if you wanted to get a tight fit to the data? Like, can you guarantee that the Nadaraya Watson interpolation passes through every point? Well, a, simple, a way of doing that is to decide that the weight, that k of xx, that the weight of a point when you evaluate it on himself, is plus infinity. And if you say that, if you say that your kernel function has a plus infinity value at uh, at zero, 
then it means that at least locally, you don't care about the other points in the training sample. And so you know that your regression curve is going to pass through every point. And so a simple way of doing that is to use a degenerate function here. Instead of an exponential, a Cauchy kernel, you can use one over the distance. One over the distance, it, it's equal to plus infinity uh, at zero. And so it guarantees this property. And so this is, no, this is very well known in statistics. It's known as Shepard interpolation. So this is what you get. K of x, y, one over the distance. You get a curve that uh, passes through every point. But also since one over x, since the inverse function has a very heavy tail, it's also outside of the training data set, it's dampened towards the average value. So maybe instead, uh, of this perfect fit, you, you say, I want something even more dampened. So instead of using one over the distance, you use one over the square root of the distance. Because one over the square root of the distance has a much heavier tail, if you remember your, uh, your lessons from high school about the elementary functions. And so this is what you can do. A Shepard, uh, Shepard interpolation with a very uh, singular and heavy tail kernel uh, gets you this kind of function. So not very useful. Instead, we can use a Shepard kernel, a degenerate kernel uh, that has a very light tail, nearly compact support in a way. So something like one of the, the squared of the distance. And this is what you get. Okay. Maybe you go even further, one over uh, the distance at the power four. And once again, you retrieve, you retrieve something that looks like nearest neighbor interpolation. Okay. So you know, pretty, pretty cool to see that you don't have to use Gaussian kernels. Uh, you can you have a wide range of classes available and you can design your function according to the behavior that you want. So that's the main message. But okay, as you, as, as you said, oh, we're using a fraction. Maybe we can do something a bit more clever uh, or a, a bit more cute, maybe by trying to, uh, to find a real linear combination. Because if I do that, maybe. I'm ready to get a nice mathematical structure. And so in the future, it's going to be very useful for other methods. Okay. And so this is the main motivation for trying to solve linear reg uh, kernel regression by solving a linear system. So let me come back to uh, my original problem statement. I was saying that I'm looking for a parametric form for my, uh, for my model, so f of x should be equal to a1 phi of x minus x1 plus a2 phi of x minus x2 plus a n phi of x minus xn. So, yeah. so my kernel function now is more like phi. Uh, and so it's parameterized by those n uh, scalar weights. And what I want to achieve is to find weights such that when I evaluate my function on the data points, I get more or less the ground truth values. So I get this set of n equations, a1 phi of x1, basically f of x1 should be more or less y1, f of xn should be more or less yn. And when I write it down this way, you see that you have n equations, n linear equations with respect to a. And so you realize that finding good kernel uh, uh, interpolation weights should be just as simple as uh, inverting this matrix phi, okay, where uh, in phi you just have the values of phi of xi minus xj. So that's what you can hope to achieve. But then you, re you remember what we said about polynomial regression, and you realize that probably it's not a very wise idea to try to do that, because here I have n equations, mm -hmm. For n parameters, I'm going to have a fit, clearly. So instead of trying to enforce equality, I'm going to target a trade-off between accuracy and smoothness. So I'm going to try to minimize with respect to the, to the vector A, to the vector weight A, a trade-off between a least squared error, so phi A minus Y, plus a regularization term. Now, we have a minimization problem if you remember what we said on neural networks, if we want life to be easy, we need this function to be convex. Okay, otherwise it's going to be a nightmare. So that's why people came up with different regularization terms that are all convex. 
so it means that you can also then using black box solver, no questions asked, but that enforce different properties. So the main one, the most important one is the ridge regression, which is just a parameter alpha, a bit like the threshold T like uh, for my decision trees, but alpha times the squared norm uh, of the vector of parameters A. So alpha times A1 squared plus, uh, plus A, A n squared. That's ridge regression. And this promotes, it just says that the, the, the values of I should be, uh, should be small. Uh, but in the, um, in the ball, so we have no bias along the axis or whatever. We, we're just saying, try to find a linear combination of, uh, of, the, of, of, of those things, of, of the phi's. But don't find solutions where you have plus 10,000, uh, minus 1 million, etc. Because you know that this is the type of solution that pops up when you try to invert a matrix which is badly conditioned. And you say, which is ill-conditioned. And you say, no, no, I don't want that. So stay in a ball around zero. So that's ridge regression. Then you have lasso regression. I'm sure that you have lectures about that in the MBA. The idea here is that instead of using uh, a Euclidean ball, you're using an L1 norm. And the idea, so we're not going to discuss it here, but the idea of this L1 norm is that it promotes sparsity. If you solve this type of mixed problem with an, a squared Euclidean norm plus an L1 norm, so just a sum of absolute values, naturally you're going to promote solutions where most coefficients A's are zero and a few important coefficients are non-zero. And in some applications, this is important for like uh, interpretability, robustness, etc. So it's been ex extensively studied. And then elastic net is just combination of the two. And I think those three uh, problems, like ridge regression, lasso regression, elastic net regression, it's like the bread and butter of uh, mathematical data science, uh, or at least it was uh, 10 years ago. Okay. So that's, that's what everyone knows. It's, now it's very well packaged. But let's just focus on the simplest one, which is a ridge regression. Okay. Ridge regression is what you get when you have, so you try to solve this minimization problem, phi a minus y plus alpha a squared. So we say, okay, I have the square Euclidean norms. I don't understand. What I understand is matrices. So I unfold everything using matrices. And so you know that the, the norm of a is just a t a. So you have a vector, right? a t a. So you say, Okay, so you can unfold this, or maybe I should have added a trace. Sorry, <laughs> I wrote it uh, yesterday evening. Uh, maybe there's a trace somewhere to, to make it work, but okay, I'm going to maybe to update the slide. Uh, may maybe not. But anyway, okay, this is a matrix form, and you have terms that are dependent on A. You have quadratic terms in terms of A, linear, linear terms, and constant terms. So in the second line here, I, ju I just factor everything quadratic with respect to A. So I get the matrix uh, phi T phi plus alpha times the identity. A linear term, which is like this minus two Y transpose phi and a constant term. And we don't care about the constant term because we are minimizing with respect to A. And then you have this, it's just a quadratic function of A. And so you know that the solution has this form. Okay, so you just need to invert this matrix, uh, and you get that, and so you rewrite it uh, using another expression, and so you see that A is phi transpose times phi phi transpose plus alpha identity minus one y. So you, you just see that, you say, actually, I don't really care about A. What I care about is my interpolation. So I care about phi A. And so f of x, it's phi A. A is just a solution of a quadratic Problem, so maybe it's a bit intimidating because it's multivariate. But in uh, you know in one D, you would just solve that using uh, middle school mathematics, and you have this equation: uh, phi phi t phi phi t plus alpha minus one y. And here, what you see is that you have a fundamental object that appears, which is a matrix K phi, which is equal to phi phi t. You see, we don't really care about phi alone; we only care about phi phi t the matrix that contains all the dot products between the rows of phi. Okay, it's, it's something which is symmetric, positive, semi-definite. So for instance, you know that this linear system, it's going to be okay. Uh, 
it's invertible as soon as alpha is uh, larger than uh, strictly larger than zero. Okay, maybe basically. So it's clear for you if you've done a lot of uh, prepa mathematics of linear algebra. Otherwise, maybe not. You don't really care. Okay, it's just you can think of it as just dividing by a positive coefficient. So it should be okay. You know, I'm, I'm never dividing by zero here. So we're good. And but then you think, okay, maybe k. So the only matrix that I care about is a matrix k. And if I'm able to compute k, I'm able to compute k plus alpha times the identity. Then I'm able to solve this linear system, and I'm able to compute k times the thing. So now, from an algorithmic perspective, the only thing that matters is how fast can I compute k, the matrix which has n rows and columns, and whose coefficients are given by this formula, k equals phi phi t. So okay, k i j corresponds to x i and x j. It's a dot product between two rows of the matrix phi, and so it's just a sum of n terms. Uh, so it has this expression. And then you look at this expression and you say, oh, it's a bit of a shame because it starts to be expensive, right? You have a matrix n by n coefficients, and each coefficient I need to evaluate phi n times. So it's cubic. Okay. Maybe linear is great, log linear is great. Quadratic complexity, it's still fine. Cubic complexity it starts to be a bit heavy. So a bit down. And on top of that, you know, this sum, it depends upon the precise sampling points that you chose. So it doesn't look very universal. So maybe, maybe you're stuck here, but maybe instead, you know, you read a book or you're very clever and you realize that probably instead of using this discrete sum over all points X, S, I can replace this expression with a continuous sum. So try to imagine that instead of having a discrete number of sampling points, I have basically all my, I, I allow myself to consider all uh, translated copies of my kernel function, not just the, not just the translated copies uh, that are centered around uh, data points. So, and so if if I allow that, in a way, I have an infinite number of points excess, and so my sum kind of becomes an integral at the limit. And so you can think that what matters more actually is the function k of x i x j, which is the integral of a dot product between those two. Uh, translate infections. And the good thing now is that since now the, the, this expression, you know, doesn't depend upon the point x s, it's just an integral over r or over r two. Basically, it's an integral over your domain. For many interesting uh, forms of phi, you can just do the computation. You ask Mathematica, and you get uh, your, your kernel function k. So that that's known as a kernel trick. Just uh, kind of prefactor mm -hmm. this computation into your resolution of this problem. Okay, so in practice, you know, if now you're, you you go full algorithmic mode, you say I don't care about phi, I care about k because this is the function that defines the kernel matrix. So the question, if you take, the, if you turn around the question, you say, what are the functions k that can be written in this form using a suitable function phi? And then you have a simple answer, at least on R2, like on the Euclidean domain, that you have a sufficient criterion. If the Fourier transform of K is real valued and positive, then it's fine. You just, you just define phi through its Fourier transform, and its Fourier transform should be the square root of the Fourier transform of K. And you're good. Like, uh, you, then you know, essentially, that uh, this equality is going to be satisfied. Mm -hmm. So just basic uh, pr properties about the Fourier transform. Essentially, the fact that you know this is actually here k is actually a convolution between phi and an, a mirrored version of phi. So and you know that a convolution <coughs> uh, you know that a convolution in Fourier domain it's just a multiplication. So here when you're asking can my function k be decomposed as a convolution of phi convolved with phi or phi convolved with a transpose? You're really asking, can the Fourier transform of k be decomposed as the Fourier transform of a nice function, like of a symmetric function, etc.? And, and this is where the criterion comes from. Okay, so and a good uh, 
good uh, good news. I mean, all the functions I showed you, like Cauchy, exponential, uh, Gaussian, they all satisfy this criterion because the Fourier transform of a Gaussian is a Gaussian, so it's real valued and positive. The real uh, the Fourier transform, at least in one D, at least in uh, at least in one D, the Fourier transform of an exponential kernel is a Cauchy kernel, so it's positive. And the Fourier transform of a Cauchy kernel is an exponential kernel, so it's positive. And so everything fits together. And then you say, okay, basically, if you want your uh, linear regression problem to be to be well posed, you need your function to have positive uh, Fourier transform. And then you know that kernel ridge regression simply relies on this model. It's just f of x. It's k times k plus alpha identity minus one y. And all the dependency between the points x is hidden in the kernel function uh, k that defines your kernel matrix. So it's remarkably, um, so the good thing about this model is that, okay, you have to do a few calculations, a few computations, but then you have, you, you end up on a single formula where, um, you know, the, that looks like a fine uh, mode. Like, for instance, you see that if alpha is equal to zero, like if you have no regularization, then this is just k, k minus one y, and so you get y. So you know that if alpha equals to zero, you overfit. So you, you see these things immediately. So it's uh, it's great form, and as we're going to see, it's very expressive because you have uh, you allow people to choose their kernel function, and so you allow people to choose. Uh, the family of function of functions among which uh, we are going to pick uh, our, our estimator. So that's for the math side. On the computational side, it's also it also streams extremely well on GPUs. For so currently, like as of 2022, if you want to solve this linear system efficiently, so if you have less than 10,000 points, anything is fine. Like you use PyTorch, uh, inverting, uh, solving a linear system with 10,000 rows. Uh, it takes a fraction of a second. So this, this is easy, easy. But now, what if you want to scale to large data sets? Well, the good news is that if you have maybe a million, a million of points, if your kernel matrix implicitly is a matrix with a million rows, a million columns, then actually you know that brute force solvers uh, may still uh, solve this system in seconds. Okay, so that's the Kiops library that I'm going to present to you. Uh, in the last uh, lecture of the of the uh, of the class, mm -hmm. and if you want to go even further, like if you want to scale to like ImageNet datasets, uh, maybe billions of points, then okay, you cannot solve it exactly uh, brute force. Uh, it becomes a bit too large. But people have developed approximate methods uh, that I mean, that perform very well, and that invert those billion scale in our systems in something like hours. And just to tell you that if you implement this naively, it looks cubic because you have uh, an n by n matrix. You try to solve a system. If you read a standard linear algebra textbook, people are going to tell you it's cubic. But actually, no, no. you can be clever. You can essentially uh, get it down to more like quadratic complexity or very, very fast cubing. So it totally scales. So now, you know, as a conclusion on that, uh, before showing you a few examples, just to tell you, that kernel ridge regression has a rich history uh, in applied mathematics. And for instance, uh, I think the Wikipedia page about that, it, it, it's, a, it's not presented as kernel regression, it's presented as cringing. And cringing, because it's the name of a, not of a geostatistician, but of a geologist, a South African geologist, I think he worked in the 50s, uh, which, is, which was called Krij. And basically his job, was to find, uh, he was drilling holes uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the soil uh, and telling, okay, at this location, I have granite, in this location, I have basalt. And you have those drilling locations. Obviously, you're looking for oil or for gold. Uh, and your main question is, can I extrapolate this data to the whole domain? And so can I do regression? And even more interestingly, can I know where I have uncertainty, like because if if you're if you're if you're if you're a geologist, you're interested in both in understanding the soil composition, given your current samples, but you're also interested in knowing 
where should be your next drill? Like, where should you, should, should, should your next drill be to, me, to, to best improve your information? And the thing is that all those problems, you know, they are associated to those kind of curves where you have samples, and so you want to find a, a good fit, and you want to estimate confidence intervals. And obviously, if you're a geologist here, you want to, you want to make your new drill somewhere around here, you know, to, to get data points on regions of low information. And all those things are super easy to study using this theory. Yeah, because this theory is completely behind Sobolev norms, Gaussian processes, so mm -hmm. probability distribution, really. And we're going to talk about that in lecture six. Okay, one of the hardcore uh, uh, classes of the lectures of the class. So, but that's fine. So now let's just look at pictures. I mean, it works exactly as we expect. So, if you have your data points and you say that you're going to use a very smooth global Gaussian kernel with a radius which is equal to the diameter of the configuration. So here sigma is equal to one, and everything is super smooth, you get something that looks like a linear regression because the model is unable, like it's, it's as if he was very myopist, uh, he ca cannot see any detail. If you want to get a closer mm -hmm. fit, you know, you, you just have to decrease the radius of your kernel so sigma equals to 0 0.5, you estimate a function that is as smooth as a Gaussian kernel of radius 0 0.5, and so it looks like this, look like this. 0 0.2, better fit, uh, 0 0.1, clearly you have a fit. But um, so you have a fit here, and here you see that since my Gaussian kernel has compact support, if, my, if I take a very small radius, then you see that outside of the training data, I have zero information, and so the model just says zero. That's, I mean, that's what picking a local Gaussian kernel does for you. So if you don't want that, maybe you say, I'm going to use this heavy tail Cauchy kernel. Yes, yeah, so there you extrapolate. And maybe you're going to say, no, no, I want to have a close fit to the data, and so you're going to pick a pointy kernel, exponential of minus the distance. Actually, there's a simple way, parameter-free way, of getting both of these behavior, so both long range interactions and pointy kernels, and it's just by uh, choosing as a baseline minus the distance. So minus the distance kernel, it's, it's completely a valid kernel. Uh, and you see it's both, it's, it's both pointy and uh, doesn't fade to zero at infinity. You can understand it as an exponential kernel, but with a, an infinite uh, radius. Like, or a radius which is larger than the one uh, of your data set. And I would say, you know, that would be maybe the final advice about this, is that probably when you're going to learn about uh, kernel methods, if you go and say keep learn, uh, the default kernel is a Gaussian kernel. In some settings, it's fine. But always remember that it is very smooth, very local. Maybe you want the complete opposite. Maybe you want the complete opposite uh, behavior. And the complete opposite behavior is given by this minus distance kernel. So it could be interesting for you to, to, to remember this. So conclusion. Well, you see numerous regression models, okay? And what I wanted uh, to, to give you for this baseline, uh, I mean, for these lectures about baseline, is a graphical interpretation of all these methods. You know, okay, this is what a decision tree looks like. This is a random forest. This is nearest neighbors. This is neural networks, linear, cubic, shepherd, and kernel ridge regression. Okay, this is what they look like. And you see that uh, maybe on the surface, they, they are very, very different because they are trained using completely different theories. So the algorithms are not entirely similar and the theories to explain the algorithms are completely different. So it's very common to have people who are experts on kernels who know nothing about decision trees. You know, so because the, the math that you use to study the different types of regularization are very different. But you see that uh, here, at least on those examples, they produced still roughly similar results. Maybe you know, like they all say that okay, uh, this is red, this is blue, uh, in a way. And and notably, you see that. I mean, throughout the lecture, we only talked about examples in dimension one and two. We didn't address the curse of dimensionality. And so this is going to be actually the start of the lecture next week, which is that all these methods, you know, 
they are fine. So decision trees are sparse. So maybe uh, if you have a very well conditioned problem, they are going to to fare well uh, in a, in a, in in a, in a high dimensional setting. But overall, all the other ones like nearest neighbors kernels, they rely extensively on the matrix of distances between points. And the curse of dimensionality, it's about overfitting, but it's also about the fact that we're going to see next week that for a Gaussian sample in high dimension, the distance matrix is completely uninformative. And you, you can show it, and it's a very simple theorem to see that. And so this is going to motivate people, this is what motivates people to define other metrics, basically to go beyond Euclidean, beyond um, Manhattan, like L2, L1 metrics, essentially, because the simple metrics, they are great. If you have high quality features that allow you to express to, to solve your problem with few features, but if you go in a very high dimensional setting, you're going to need something a bit more ad hoc, uh, a bit more custom. And usually, uh, I mean, very often, custom metrics are encoded as graphs. And so this is why the next lecture is going to be about graphs. <laughs>